corruptive power of the false, right, that undermines the true, which was the job that literature, literature was explicitly given throughout the postmodern linguistic turn years. What, for example, would deconstruction be without its breathless claims to literature's resistance to philosophy, consistently interrupting the sinister dream of reified, completed meaning? And this assault on reification is likewise the kindred thread that connects deconstruction with other postmodern critical discourses that may have seemed hostile toward deconstruction in its day. For example, Marxist or new historicist work on politics. All that literary critical work was territorialized in the power of literature as the power of interruption, interrupting totalization, a certain weak power of the false. And for interruption to function plausibly as a mode of resistance to truth, the primary theoretical problem logically has to rest in a social system that does whatever sinister work it does through its desire for totalization. <coughs> In other words, in the end, what's subverted in virtually all postmodern notions of subversion is this desire for totalized meaning. Okay. Hence the great thematics of literature as an interruptive mode of what Demond called negative assurance. The literary as the primary guarantee of Adorno's negative certainty catchphrase, the whole is false. Right? Literature will always show you that any particular point of view is incomplete, that any particular truth is subject to reinterpretation. Um, and thereby, for many modern post postmodern theorists, modern and postmodern theorists, literature and language have also functioned as powerful models of resistance to the exclusions and closures, characteristics of fascism, racism, sexism, and the mutually assured destruction of the Cold War nation state. To put it bluntly, all the potential functions of literature and language got overcoded in the postmodern years by literature's ability to interrupt something like truth. Right? Literature carried a certain power of the false, but one that was characterized almost wholly by the negative work that literature can do. Literature's power was found in displaying the inability of its, of its binary partner, truth or meaning. Of course, that interruptive power of the false under postmodernism thereby remained oddly parasitic on falsification's relation to what remains necessarily the primary mode, the power of the true. Right? If your primary power is hollowing out something else, then you are dependent on that something else. Right? That something else has to be there and has to be. So this weak or postmodern power of the false, in other words, has no power of its own, one that's not already understood in terms of truth and its discontents, right? It's a corrosive or undermining kind of power. But what of this other, other power of the false? The power not to interrupt existing truths, but to create objects or posit different ways of separating out the true and the false. Um, what, Foucault, what Foucault calls the creation of new modes of veridiction, new ways of telling the truth. What are the powers of the false that are directly related to its ability to create rather than primarily to subvert? Um, those affirmative powers of the false rather than the primarily negative ones. Um, and for me, another way of saying this might be, what about a kind of a hermeneutics of situation? Like, what is theory good for? What can it be used for in the present? Rather than a hermeneutics of suspicion, like how can it undermine something else, a pre-existing? When I think about this strong power of the false in literature, where it's on display in its most intense fashion, I tend to think first of the work done by so-called language poet Bruce Andrews, whose composition method consists of writing down phrases and sentences on small rectangular pieces of paper and editing them together into discontinuous onslaughts of phrasing. The result looks something like this, it's on your handout, um, which is more or less randomly chosen chunk from the opening section of his book, I Don't Have Any Paper or so shut up, or social romances. Uh, it goes something like this. Brandish something clean. There is no more reason to limit ourselves to the customary rhetorical confinement. Wet commission. Piss shall triumph. Get busy looking at immaculate doves. I couldn't stab myself. You want sub gum? Fuck your chicken. Gandhi becomes handsome cholo. I hate scenes. And palpitating. Candle suckers don't react to the given. Dignity for resale. Ankle be sister. Farm fear swallows the... The unwary unison, feeble heard, heard such me mug, sauce plenitude preservatives, spores, variable halva. Thinking about genocide all the time makes me hopeful. Catholics fly to the lips and smoke out the sting. You can poop my duck. Mastery of craft, turquoise makes the eye dumb stick. Buckets of chicken urine in the blue, gauzy, non-urban sounds apocryphal. Blood of drum majors to cause their trouble. Once bread got that staff of life crap attached to it, it became inedible. Wasn't it Solzhenitsyn that parted, pardoned Patty Hearst? And it goes on and on and on. Um, in Andrew's work, it's as if the entirety of poetic meter had been reduced to spondee. The desire is at least for all stressed syllables all the time. Unwary, unison, feeble, heart, such, me, mug, sauce, plenitude, preservative, spores. Um, 
And literature is thereby reduced, like a watery sauce is reduced, to its strongest version. Not the job of meaning or edification, get busy looking at immaculate doves, or even the job of pleasure. There is no more reason to limit ourselves to customary rhetorical confinement, but to the austere task of relentless provocation. Fuck your chicken. Or sorry, fuck your kitchen. <laughs> chicken <laughs> <by the back>. <laughs> <laughs> Literature gets repurposed in Andrew's work precisely because of its two easy links to the sacred trace of meaning. Once the bread got that staff of life crap attached to it, it became inedible. Of course, there's certainly a kind of interruption here in his work, parataxis in perhaps its strongest form, but the focus is not so much on deforming wholeness, where would totalization rest on the force field that is this page, but obsessively on production of all kinds, all the myriad productive powers of the false. So there are reflexive or critical statements here, there's nonsense, insults, porn lingo, slightly, cha slightly changed ad buster style slogans, hate speech, bureaucratic discourse, and its evils of banality, religion, cult of personality, so on and so forth. Andrew speeds up language as a series of creative practices, rather than <coughs> primarily slowing poetry down and territorializing it on one function, language's meaning or lack thereof. It's the confrontation of performative or inventive force that you see on every line. In every gap, there's not meaning waiting to burst forth or not, but a kind of hinge, linkage, movement, or intensification, what Andrews calls torque. And this torque returns poetry to a series of other jobs, functions that it had years, even millennia, before poetics became inexorably tied to the question of meaning. Here we see poetry function as a discourse that's ceremonial, aggressive, passive, communal, seductive, repulsive, humorous, persuasive, insulting, praising, performative, and a lot more. But one thing this, do this work doesn't do, or even really attempt, is to mean something. What you get in Andrew's text is precisely a kind of massive overcoding operation kind of a schizoid dialect, dialectic of language mishmashed all at once. Reading, then, is less a hermeneutic operation than it is the kind of performance that Andrew sometimes does with dancers and other musical improv improvisers. They respond to his words with their own riffs. They do their own readings of these provo provocations as bodily sound gestures, movements, translations. And I think that's what reading it is like. It's not, it's not a hermeneutic operation. It's kind of how do you respond to it? What do you do with this language? How do you torque it? Uh, perhaps an even sharper example of this kind of post-postmodern writing practice is to be found in the work of so-called conceptual writers. The leading practitioner and theorist of this movement, Kenneth Goldsmith, suggests that he doesn't so much write in the sense of innovating new forms or expressing anything in particular as he does transcribe quite literally. His magnum opus trilogy, The Weather, Sports, and Traffic, consists of straight transcriptions of the 11 o'clock news reports. That's the sample on your handout. Um, a year of 11 o'clock news reports, a baseball game, uh, that's sports, every word of a single Yankee, broad, Yankee game broadcast on the radio, and traffic reports, a full day of traffic on the ones. As well as works he's, he's written, or written isn't even the right word, that he's produced, uh, that consist of retyping every single word in the New York Times for a single day, which becomes the 900-page book, Day. Every movement made by the author for a 13-hour period, fidget, Every utterance for a week, soliloquy, and what is to my mind his masterpiece, which is called Head Citations, a list of more than 800 misheard popular song lyrics. So like, Killing Me Softly with Islam, or Mrs. Clown Control to Mao Zedong. <laughs> There's a bathroom on the right. <laughs> the point of all this, you ask? Goldman thematizes his writing practice like this. This is a quote from Goldsmith. In 1969, conceptual artist Douglas Hubler wrote, the world is full of objects, more or less interesting. I do not wish to add any more. I've, Goldsmith, has come to embrace Hubler's idea, though it might be retooled as, the world is full of texts, more or less interesting. I do not wish to add any more. It seems an appropriate response to a new condition of writing today. Faced with an unprecedented amount of available text, the problem is not needing to write more of it. Instead, we must learn to negotiate the vast quality, quantity that exists. I've transformed from a writer into an information manager, adept at the skills of replicating, organizing, mirroring, archiving, hoarding, storing, reprinting, bootlegging, plundering, and transferring. Close quote. He's also the, um, the um, curator of Google Web, if you know what that is. It's a, it's a web warehouse of all kinds of online art, art practices. Goldsmith's poetics puts him squarely within an internet age. 
What does writing look like when a searchable database of nearly everything ever written is within reach of anyone with an internet connection? If postmodernism played to endgame the thematics of innovation that was born in modernism, can you really make it newer in the 21st century? Then the problems of writing shift to negotiating through this vast archive of powers of the false. The creative powers in combining pre-existing language rather than hoping through force of creative will to add something new to that archive. As Goldsmith puts it succinctly, succinctly, referring both to conceptual writing he's aligned with and FLARF, a rival but related movement dedicated to writing poems through internet searches. Quote, with so much available language, does anyone really need to write more? Instead, let's just process what exists. Language as matter, language as material. When Presto explains further, Goldsmith likes to quote Brian Geissen's mid-20th century observation that writing is 50 years behind painting. And certainly his project owes much to the Barosian cut-up and the anti-subjectivist collage and splatter methods of modernist visual art. What do, sculpture, or what do sculptors do but take blocks of given material and carve something out of them? What does Jackson Pollock foreground but the basic stuff of painting? Brushstroke movement and oil paint, that's all there is. Ditto someone like Rothko, color and shape. Not inventing anything new in terms of what art is on a traditional register, but inventing new questions, juxtapositions, modes of provocation, which is, of course, what visual art has become, a series of discourses and practices more than a series of discrete objects. The mid-20th century conundrums that force painting into abstract expressionism and pop art, which is to say the economic and technological truism that photography had by that point completely taken over figuration, have for a long time now hung over literature as well, and especially poetry. If advertising has completely territorialized short, pithy expressions of sentiment or authentic sentiment, showing us how to re-enchant even the most mundane corners of our everyday life, if everything's an opportunity for self-actualization, doing the laundry, driving your car, uh, even your job, then what's left for poetry to do in a post-postmodern world? On someone like Andrew's account, what's left for poetry is relentlessly to attack and avoid those very structures of meaning, to reinvent or re-emphasize alternative uses for poetry for intense language usage that have long since been forgotten as the lyric became the safe repository for our authentic true feelings or affects. And Goldsmith's project is certainly related to Andrew's, deploy language as powers of the false, create something new out of something old, but goes in a slightly different direction. As Goldsmith writes about work like Andrew's, quote, language poetry has fulfilled the trajectory of modernist writing as such, has succeeded in pulverizing syntax and meaning into a handful of dust. At this point, though, to grind the sand any finer would be futile. So for Goldsmith, the critique in this work, if there is to be one, is found not so much within the work itself, or its form, or its parataxis, or something like it, but in what, in what might come after the work, the discourses, acts, and further appropriations that surround, circumscribe, and respond to the work. As Goldsmith writes, quotes, the simple act of moving information from one place to another today constitutes a significant cultural act in and of itself. So this post-postmodern project constitutes a decisive turn away from the linguistic turn of, res of resistant infinite meaning, all those powers of the true and the false, um, excuse me, all those powers of the true that are beholden, all the powers of the false that are beholden to the true, and returns a different kind of density, a new set of everyday concerns concerning how one manages language overload to the complexities of contemporary language use. If everyone's a poet in this sense, it's because everyone has to sculpt his or her identity out of a vast sea of available, iterable texts and practices. Of course, this anti-originalist performativity was surely the project or home terrain of postmodernism and deconstruction as well. Although it's hard to imagine either one of those discourses working without some sense of meaning, if only negatively. So perhaps the practice of something like 